Hello, everyone. Welcome on behalf of the Goethe Institute New York. My name is Dennis Sartko, and I'm a program coordinator here. And today I'm very happy to present Memory Labs, a conversation with artist Alana Katz, with Melissa Hilliard Potter, and moderated by David C. Terry. Today's conversation will take a deeper look at two site specific performance films, Aiming for Hopelessness and Running on Empty by Alana Katz resulting from her performances in public space about social trauma and collective memory. I will now give you a short introduction to our moderator and panelists. David C. Terry is a working artist, independent curator and cultural producer, and is currently the director and curator for C24 Gallery in New York City. Terry was previously a visiting faculty member at Bard College Berlin. Prior to that, Terry was the director and curator of grants and exhibitions at the New York Foundation for the Arts for 16 years. He has served as a board member of the College Art Association and an executive member of the Fine Arts Federation. Melissa Hilliard Potter is an interdisciplinary artist, writer and curator with more than 20 years of experience collaborating in Southeast Europe. She is an associate professor at Columbia College Chicago. Ilana Katz is a conceptual artist working primarily in the medium of performance art. Her work confronts cultural conventions and critically examines the complexity that lies within contradictions, aiming to create an experience of unlearning the assumed. With her today is Martin Quade. He is the founder and owner of Gal Gallery Quadrat. Originally founded as a project space in 2007, Quadrat has become a regular gallery after participating in art fairs in Brussels, Berlin, Kiev, and Paris. But based in Berlin Kreuzberg, Quadrat is showing painting, sculpture, multimedia, and performance art. It has become a meeting point for the young, vibrant, emergent art scene in Berlin. Before having, hand, handing it over to Martin, who will say a few words about the exhibition at Quadrat, I'd like to mention that there will be time for a Q&A towards the end of the conversation, and we invite you to ask your questions via the Q&A box. Please also note that you can see both performance films by writing us an email to program New York at goethe.de until today. In case you're watching this from Berlin, you can walk by Quadrat Gallery where Aiming for Hopelessness is being shown in the shop window until February 7th. This event is being recorded and will be made available to you on our event page and our YouTube channel. Now I'd like to thank our speakers and collaborators, C24 Gallery and Quadrat Berlin, my colleague Catherine Muller here at the Goethe Institute New York, and of course, all of you for coming. Now enjoy the conversation. Uh, yeah, thank you, Denise. Uh... Uh, yeah, my name is Martin, um, you mentioned it, um, I'm the founder and owner of Quadrat Gallery and we work with Elana for now more than four years. Um, we are showing videos, also live performance in the gallery and now, yeah, I'm very proud to show the newest work of, uh, of Elana in the window because, uh, yeah, it's the only way to show something in Berlin because it's forbidden to um, also, it's forbidden to show people by appointment, so it's not possible to invite people to the gallery. So we decide to show the video from outside, and it looks super nice. Uh, it's a very interesting video. Uh, we have also a success with selling. Uh, it was also a surprise, and this time a lot of people are coming, really, and see the video. We show it normally from 6 to 8 p.m., uh, also today and tomorrow, and on Sunday, there is, there is a special event organized by Index Berlin. It's lights on and Index Berlin organizes it normally, yeah, often on Sundays. And this time it's super special because they make a kind of art parkour that the people can see the works from outside, inside the gallery. I just show it for a second. I was, <laughs> it's uh, just of Index Berlin. It's a, a very <laughs> important um, um, yeah, information paper uh, about the program of galleries in Berlin and yeah and now I also leave to the gallery because maybe I have some guests uh, outside and I will smoke a cigarette with them. It's allowed. <laughs> Thank you very much. 
guys. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. And the information is on the um, about the index event on Sunday is on the Matrat Instagram page, for example. You can find it there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So have a good uh, talk. Thank See you. you. <laughs> so. So while Alana sets up, uh, I will begin uh, the talk today. My name is David Terry. And uh, thank you, Martin, again. I didn't know about Index Art on Sunday, so that's kind of exciting. So since I'm in Berlin, uh, it'll be nice to be able to walk around and see things. So it's super exciting. And it's also super exciting to have everyone here today. Thank you all so much for joining, taking time wherever you are in the world. And whatever time you are in your day today, uh, it's evening time and we're, we're excited for today's talk and to share the work of Alana Katz. Um, I met Alana, I would say almost about 10 years ago when I, when I traveled to Berlin and we immediately connected and got along well. And I was just very interested in the work she was doing and her voice uh, and, and how she was communicating her work and her, and her ideas. And so I thought it would be really a nice way to, to launch into seeing her videos, which is because why we're here to talk about those two pieces, but to give a bit of context behind her work and, and um, to give you guys a sense, or you all a sense of the visual aspect of her work. So um, Melissa, if you would be so kind as to start the video and these works that you'll see are really in no chronological order. The idea is primarily just for you to, to get a sense of the type of work that she does. And I'll give a little bit of um, background story or a little information as we go along. Okay, uh, let's begin next. If you didn't know, um, Alana has vast experience as a dancer, very rigorous um, uh, practice. You can go next. This is a still from a performance. Uh, one of the things that I think is very important to, to know here is that her work uh, is performance work. It's performance based, but it's also visually based. And I think that's something that's very important that you'll see in these in these images, as well as in the two videos. So when you're looking at it, and she also has a background in, in education and photography. So when you're looking at these images, there's a lot of decision-making that's happening. There's the decision in the placement of things, the objects that you see here, the timer, even the irons or, or uh, the spray bottle. So this is simply a still. So there's an entire aesthetic that's happening uh, with the work and with the, the performance that is also uh, another layer into the work. Next. Next. A lot of her work is uh, durational, meaning uh, she spends extensive hours performing it, sometimes up to 16 hours, if not even more. Uh, a lot of it is, uh, the process is self-inflicting uh, as well. So there are cases where in order for, she's like a method performance artist. She lives and experiences the work that she's talking about. Um, and really that's kind of how she um, feels it and fulfills the concept to put her place and her body physically into that situation in those circumstances. Next. This is a two channel video. That's actually Alana in both images. Um, uh, and she mentioned that they aligned up perfectly, which is kind of remarkable. Next. This is another durational piece. It's about an hour long. Uh, again, keeping in mind the, the visual along with the performance of it, because the visual is speaking as well. So the thing is like, I think even if a lay person just doesn't get the work, doesn't understand it, they're gonna understand some visual aspect. They're gonna be able to connect to some visual aspect. They're gonna, theoretically, we all have a body. So you can at least relate to the body, the body being punished, the body being uh, sustained in a, in a specific position, um, muscle tension, mind control, emotion control, uh, tuning out audience and, and you know, outside noises. These are all things that, that take intensive um, concentration, meditation and preparation. Next, please. Again, the, the visual choices as a still, I think these, these images work as images alone as artistic images alone beyond the performance themselves. Next, please. 
This was uh, the first one of, one of the first uh, works that Alana and I collaborated on. Collaborated meaning, I asked her to perform in this uh, exhibition that I that I curated at the Lumen Festival in um, in Staten Island in New York, and it's at a uh, park, Atlas Park, and it's in a large pool. Next image, please. And uh, you can see the 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 um, folks watching the performance, and it went into the evening. This is. I think eight hours from daytime into the evening where she was blowing bubbles in this pool all evening long, hours long, repetitive motion. It, it, I still can't believe how she was able to kind of maintain that kind of mind and body control. Uh, next, please. Uh, this is an earlier work. One of the works that really got me interested in, in Alana and what she was doing, this is titled Skin. Um, Next, please. Again, not just the work, not just the material, but embodying what is happening, um, really kind of becoming one with the whole process. It's not, she's not separated from the work, not separated from the object, she's living in it. Next, please. I was mentioning uh, trauma, life experience, the body, um, some pain, self-inflicted, representational of other wounds. These are sort of the, the, the context and, and the themes that will be kind of coming around this time. It's, it's sort of in the description, the ideas of histories of trauma, manifestations of memory, memory repeating, collective memory, as well as the consequences of denial and just plain outright denial. Next, please. And so, uh, yeah, part of it is is her embodying a characterization of the idea or of a concept, um, whether that's visual, emotional, mental, spiritual, um, or just physical, physically being a space or, or walking through and living in that time period in that timeline. That's another thing how she she feels and, and creates the work. Um, so with this in mind, all, all that background now that you all have, I'd like to introduce you all to my colleague, Melissa Potter, and she's going to tell you a little bit about her work and her background, because this all sort of dovetails into Alana's work as well. So Melissa, and don't forget to unmute me. Ah, yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, David and Alana. Um, David and I have known each other for a very long time, and Alana and I have just gotten to know one another. And I, I agree with David, there are wonderful synergies here to explore. Um, I had the privilege of witnessing firsthand the historic moment of late 20th century former Yugoslavian artistic traditions, which now, 20 years later, are amplifying the region that Alana does her work in. Uh, I've been making art, teaching, and writing in the former Yugoslavia since the year 2000, after the NATO offensive. Through an ArtsLink grant and three Fulbrights, I worked with artists and ultimately created a long-term relationship with the Faculty of Fine Arts, University of Belgrade, bringing the little-known tradition of hand paper making to a generation of students who are still practicing today. Uh, this image was... Um, in Sarajevo on my third Fulbright, and I built another studio for them as well at the Academy. So I uh, started a 20 year long term collaboration with the region. Um, I started writing reviews for magazines like Bomb, Art Papers and Metropolis M. Um, there wasn't really anybody writing at the time. I, I reviewed the first major show on post-war art outside of Serbia at the Austrian Cultural Forum called Serbia Frequently Asked Questions, featuring artists like Milica Tomic and Henri Salah. My research took me all through the region, teaching hundreds of students at schools, and through personal friends and partnerships with the Ethnographic Museum in Belgrade, I began to study the craft and intangible heritage culture of women in visits to villages all over the region, hundreds over the course of the next 20 years. One of my projects was a film about Stana Sarevic, featured here, a woman who lives as a man to inherit her father's property. They're called Virginas. It's an ancient uh, tradition of the region, which has almost vanished, and she is known as the last sworn virgin. 
Uh, I worked with her starting in 2009, and she passed away um, as an elderly woman in 2016. I continued work on the region's um, intangible heritage practices, this image from Republic of Georgia, reviving the disappearing felt craft um, of their uh, people as an artistic media and activist protest method. Um, in this case, we produced um, felted banners with women throughout the rural regions, and they were featured in what is here the first International Women's Day March in Tbilisi. This is an image of uh, the three of us wearing uh, felted masks at the border of Dagestan in, in rural Tusheti. And I always find myself going back to the region. I, I describe it as a feminist psychogeography homing instinct. Um, most recently, I found a series of letters my grandmother and I wrote to a Muslim refugee during the Bosnian War. My grandmother, as it turned out, was an OSS operative who was working on the Balkan desk during World War II. She never revealed this. I found this out through declassified materials that were declassified just a couple of years ago. But these letters we wrote helped me locate her when I was on residency at the Academy of Arts in Sarajevo. And since that time, I have explored the intersecting histories of women in war, trauma, and overcoming. And so you can imagine that um, uh, Ilana Katz's work inspires uh, real thought and investigation for me. So thank you again. Fantastic. Thank you, Melissa. Um, now we're going to kind of get into Alana's work. Uh, I just have a couple questions that I'm gonna to pose to Alana. So um, before you introduce your work, and I really just wanna know, this is sort of going back to some of the images and to, to the work and, and you were actually living in Berlin when I met you and I was uh, living in, in New York. Um, I wonder, you know, you were practicing in New York for, for a time and um, what was it that brought you uh, from there to Berlin? Um, yeah, I mean, towards the, towards the end of my studies in New York, I actually studied photography, fine art photography, but by the end of that, I was already doing performance art. Um, and I was just really, I had sort of been introduced to the contemporary art scene in Berlin um, and, and of Germany, and I found it to be extremely experimental and conceptual and uh, kind of more interesting, much more interesting than the art scene I was in there. Um, Mm -hmm. in New York at that time. And so I wanted to pursue okay, a way to, to come here. And, um, and so I approached, uh, yeah, I entered a class in the UDK, in the University of the Arts in Berlin. And this was really a fantastic opportunity that I was able to study with the professor Katarina Dieberding. Um, then I had the DAD scholarship, um, right. you know, <laughs> graduate study. So there was, yeah, I was able to set something up here in this really uh, open doors uh, for being able to immediately have sort of a network. And it wasn't mm -hmm. intended, but I stayed at this point. <laughs> well, we're, we're glad that you did, for sure. Um, I wanted to ask you, and, and, I, and I know you sort of were doing that before, but, but really I, I feel like there's been more focus certainly with your, your current work, the work that we're gonna be discussing. Um, but when did you begin working on work? And I, and I know we all have our own cultural and ethnic heritage and, and they're with us all the time, right? And we're always working on the time. But when did you sort of begin working and, and sort of pushing them forward more so? And if you wouldn't mind maybe coming a little closer to the microphone um, so that I can hear you a bit better, please. Yeah, much better. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yes, well, so the work that I did, I did really like seven years of work in the Balkans. Um, and uh, basically how I came to this is that living in Germany, I became very, very, um, yeah, very aware of these layers of history upon which societies are built, you know. And the way that history is dealt with in Germany is quite interesting. Uh, there's a, a lot of education, uh, attention surrounding history. And I always say that it's like a hyper memorialized society. There's really practices of memorialization very present. Mm -hmm. um, and I became interested in how, yeah, moving further east for a variety of very complex uh, reasons, there is more of a tendency towards erasure, erasure of places um, mm -hmm. that uh, pertain to uh, histories of, in, in this case, I'm looking at the Jewish subcultures that, uh, that were there that no longer exist. 
Right. And um, so what I'm particularly interested in is like, uh, okay, these, these communities or these subcultures no longer exist also for a variety of reasons. It's not only in Second World War, but there is this void in the society. And this void is what I became fascinated with and wanted to look into with my work. Okay. Um, so it's not specifically, I, you know, I'm Jewish and part of my family was from the Balkans. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't, I didn't consider the work to be particularly like about my, my cultural identity or about right, right. The history of them, you know, because these are human topics. This is what's so fundamental. Precisely, precisely. But that's yeah. interesting that you recognized a, uh, a vacancy of, of that kind of information and, and those conversations. And, I, and, I, and I, one last question before you introduce the work. Uh, did you find it more challenging working and, and, and getting information that you needed uh, further east you went or were there any challenges or was it all open for you or, yeah? Yeah, well, what was challenging is that I was essentially looking for places that no longer exist because I was looking for instances where the histories had been sort of erased from the collective memory of the surrounding society. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is sort of like doing detective work, you know. So it's right. really challenging in this way. Oftentimes I was uh, researching really mostly through the collection of oral history. And um, uh, but this was extremely energizing. It was extremely exciting. And I was very driven. And um, people were extremely open to me also with my work and extremely helpful. I think, um, yeah, there was like, a, I think it was appreciated also to, uh, that they could be in some cases um, listened to. You know? <laughs> That's fantastic. I, and I, I love hearing that, that you were actually doing detective work because I think what most people don't know, you know, the work doesn't magically arrive. Sometimes it does, but, but very often it does not. It takes a, a long period of time, months, years, research, investigation, to finally then come to have the information to then realize it either physically or visually or, or both. So I think that, you know, there's behind every image or every work, there's, there's such a long lineage of stories and contributors and, and efforts and exhaustion and pain and, and trauma and sorrow to get to where you've gotten. Um, so with that, I, I would love for you to, to talk a little bit about the two works, the excerpts of, of your pieces that we're gonna see running on empty and aiming for hopelessness. Yeah, so these two pieces are part of this like seven years of work that I did in the Balkans where I was really looking at these pervasive topics of memory, post-memory, social trauma, um, and uh, instances of historical erasure and cultivating a consciousness of the presence of absence. These were the, uh, the, the, the last works um, of the of this seven years uh, project. So we can start by looking at uh, running, um, running on empty, and I, there's a short, um, a small clip that you can show. Great. And running on empty is um, so it takes place in Serbia, um, and I run the historic route of the gas van. The gas van was a mobile uh, gas chamber that was used for a short period during the Holocaust in 1942, and it was used mostly for the extermination of women and children. Um, and it ran a route, and at the end of the route, there was a mass uh, grave. So I researched this historic route. The history itself is quite known. However, the route has been very much forgotten as integrated into the, the, the normal urban uh, or suburban uh, surroundings, you know. Um, and uh, I don't do any training for the body, so it's meant to be like a shock for the body. Uh, to just wake up and to run these 15 kilometers. And we wanted to focus on the sound of uh, the breath. Now, for me, the video is frozen. Is it working okay for you guys? <laughs> um, yeah, so the audio of the breath, because it deals with the history of, uh, yeah, of suffocation. So we had two, um, two microphones here recording my breath, also a contact microphone here that was recording my muscles. And um, I worked with a field designer who did the sound design for this piece. So we took all of this material, um, working with the sound from my body, um, and worked with different sorts of uh, manipulation, distortion, and feedback loops, um, and created a sound design that is uh, meant to mirror the way that traumatic memory functions. 
actually. And all of the sound that you hear, um, although maybe it sounds very electronic or, you know, extraterrestrial from time to something, it's all sound that we're coming from, like, uh, from the footage of the sound from my body. And yeah, so this work was um, an important work with uh, reactivating this uh, landscape of trauma that had really been integrated into the, into the mundane surrounding landscape. And, uh, and the one last thing I'll say is that I made this decision uh, with all of the electronic devices um, uh, to emphasize with the credit rather than to reveal it in any way. So it, it, it added a kind of uh, a raw aesthetic stuff that I think is quite important for the work that's happening. And then we'll have a look at aiming for hopelessness. This is the new work that I've just uh, completed yeah, this year with the editing. So it was a performance in 2016 in which I walk uh, the historic route of the death train in Romania. Uh, the death train ran two respective routes in 1941 and it was an independent Romanian initiative and it was part of the Yash program. Um, and it was uh, done, yeah, it, it was not organized, actually. It was not systematic uh, in the way that um, that this sort of thing, yeah, in the way that the Germans worked, actually. It was more of a chaotic, very passionate massacre. Um, and so people were loaded into a train. However, it wasn't really planned where the train would go. And the train kind of ran back and forth, stopping and starting during a time period that was very hot, um, you know, in order for the people inside to die, but not really with a clear destination. And ultimately then um, the destination at Poduilwaye is where there was a mass grave. Um, and this is later considered the destination of the train. However, it ran back and forth on this route for nine hours and it was a, a distance of 27 kilometers. So my performance, I make the commitment to walk from sunrise to sunset along this historic route of the death train, the 27 kilometers. But as soon as I reach that point where there was, you know, the, the end, uh, the mass grave, I just turned around and keep walking. And I could be anywhere when the sun would set and when the performance would finish. Um, but it was just actually by chance, completely unanticipated. I was arriving back in the same station uh, where I had started walking 16 hours earlier as the sun was setting. Um, yes, and now with the new editing of the work, we've really focused on uh, yeah, trying to create a disorientation of time. So you have this uh, split screen um, image and you never know which is the way there, which is the way back, uh, which is happening first, which is happening after. The times, like, it's completely distorted. There's no chronological sense with it. Um, and uh, then, yeah, how the two images are interacting. They're sometimes actually dissolving into one another. Um, creating distortion with their interaction and in other times creating dialogue with their interaction. And so, um, yeah, I'm very glad that this work is uh, five years after it was, uh, the performance took place. Now um, this video work has resulted from it. Got it, um, wonderful. I have so many questions about the, <laughs> so many technical questions, but we don't have time for all of them at all. But I do wanna ask really just a couple things about, um, well, there's one really quickly for both works, you know, the, the durational, especially 16 hours um, on aiming for hopelessness. What thoughts are in your mind as you're, as you're traversing this, this uh, experience? Um, are you humming? Are you, do you have a mantra? Are you, you know, is, it, is there anything necessarily, or you're just like, it's hot as hell. Am I crazy? <laughs> or, <laughs> I think, I think. Do you even recall? You just go into a space. I think that you, like, I go into every one of those states that you just described, you know, it's just a mm -hmm. whole, you, 
yeah this is interesting with durational work is that there's so much of this like you come to a point where your body where you feel like you're at your limits you know then you understand actually that your limit can go further then you understand where your limit is you go over your limit what Mm -hmm. lies over there on the other side over your boundary you know and um, then at moments you feel completely exhausted then an enormous amount of energy will come actually Actually, I, I remember I remember experiencing that with you once when you did when you did a performance and, and I wanted to say to you how wonderful it was. And you were just like, I can't talk right now. You know, it wasn't yeah. it wasn't like personal. It was just like, I can't I'm somewhere else. And then, you know, maybe an hour and a half later, you were all energized. And yeah, so I, I think I. Yeah, yeah. Sure. But I also. Uh, way of being. Exactly, exactly. But then like um, the physical also the, are you feeling an emotional uh, connection. I mean, you're working on these. These are seven year projects in the making that emotional, personal connection. Are you thinking about that as well when you're, when you're, um, in it, as you say? It can be. Yeah, absolutely. Uh-huh. Can be. Uh-huh. I, I don't, um, I, I don't control it. I don't try to create any sort of like to follow any protocol or to direct myself in any way that I wouldn't naturally go, you know, with my, where I am mentally or where mm-hmm. I am emotionally. So, and then, pr- yeah. Uh-huh. And then practically, um, getting up and running f- 15 kilometers, how are you, like, I couldn't do that, of course, and, and few people could, and, and, you know, without, I mean, were people monitoring your health? Did you have a, a team like, you know, professional runners do, or, or yeah, I'm, I'm curious about that, about that, like, the support that you have when you're doing this too i mean obviously you have you have filmmakers and you have an audio sound person i'm hoping there's someone there that's that's blocking traffic so you can get across the street or all those kind of crazy logistics that's where there is um for for both of those works i think that where the risk and the danger really was was actually with what we were doing first of all on the train tracks because i was walking on active train tracks for 16 hours Sometimes I'm walking besides the train tracks and that's like if because if a train would be scheduled to be coming or if, um, you know, there wouldn't be enough side, enough uh, uh, space on the sides to jump out of the way if a train would come. So there was really this <laughs> involved with oh. the train tracks. Um, and, uh, but that risk was very important for me for, for the work, you know, I mean, I mean, I didn't want to do it at the expense of my life, but I took risks. You right, know. right. Wow you know, full will with my own will. And with the running on empty as well, it was, um, I was running along the Autobahn, like the expressway at some points. It goes through many (laughs) different landscapes. And um, sometimes the little clip that uh, Melissa, that you just showed, it was actually, on quite a busy street where there was no there was no sidewalk and the reason why I'm always looking behind is because I'm checking to see if it's okay if cars are coming but I think it creates an interesting um effect of you know it looks as though one is being chased and I yeah think yeah something interesting to it but yeah those elements of <laughs> yeah there was risk involved with this and physically I think um no i I felt quite confident that I would be okay and well I, 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 yes exactly it's 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 sort of a don't try this at home thing Alana's a professional and she's been doing this for many times and she knows her body quite well um, I want to take this moment to, to invite Melissa back into the conversation um, to talk a little bit about uh, or to contextualize this work in the region with with um, a question she's posed for you Uh, Thank you. Yeah. I mean, you know what, you could contextualize this so many different ways. Um, I mean, you know, certainly in the the, um, performance art history of the 20th century and the 21st century, but uh, not everyone is familiar with the fact that the region, the former Yugoslavian region has an incredible um, distinguished legacy of female performance artists, right? So in immediately when I saw this work, there were two people, I mean, there were many that came to mind, but two in particular that I thought were really interesting points of departure. One of them is Sanja Vekovic's Prokut, which is triangle. Um, this is a, a piece that uh, I believe was shown at MoMA for a big retrospective of hers. She uh, sat on her balcony drinking and masturbating while uh, President Tito visited the city with great fanfare um, on the 10th of May in 1979. 
And then a, a work by Mila Tsatomic, who's a very you know, well-known artist from the region, who was also in uh, Serbia Frequently Asked Questions, the show I mentioned before. The piece is called The Video One Day, Instead of Night, a Burst of Machine Gun Fire Will Flash If Light Cannot Come Otherwise. And it's a piece in which she um, walks the streets of Bel Belgrade carrying a Kalashnikov. And she's visiting sites of armed rebellion against the Nazis. So for me, this was a lovely sort of point counterpoint piece. So, you know, Alana, what occurred to me very heavily was, you know, your works use your body to challenge these histories and uh, to, you know, sort of think about power and collective memory. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the idea of a woman's body as a site of resistance. Yeah, it's a really fascinating question. And um, those works, those two works that you just described, they're so iconic uh, for me. They're, they're so powerful. And um, I do think, um, my impression is with those two pieces, though, that the, um, the fact that the body is female plays more of a role for me, at least in my perception of the works. And with the work that I've done, um, yeah, with the with the body in, in this case, as you know, yeah, working with, with resistance in a way or challenging histories, um, I, I haven't been so conscious of, of gender. And so um, I, I do think that like uh, it has an importance perhaps that I'm not uh, conscious of that I haven't analyzed. And um, it's something that yeah, th thanks to your question, it's actually something that I would like to inquire into for, for myself. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the, the region is so invested in gender, uh, you know, gender is a distinguishing power factor, particularly in the um, Milosevic years, you know, so it's, it, I, yes, I think it's a fascinating question to explore. Yeah. yeah. Uh, question for both of you, do you think that is, um, you know, you're talking about that in the 70s. Is it always been uh, a tool, one's body as a tool uh, for resistance? Or do you think it's happening more and more so now? Or there are periods that are like ebb and flows? This is just a, a question for, for either of you. I mean, you know, I think that um, uh, there tends to be cross-pollination and dialogue with, you know, any particular region. I mean, the performance art movement of the United States was the genesis of a lot of movements all, all over the world and vice versa. You know, there's, there's confluence and cross-pollinations, but, um, you know, in that particular region, um, in the open society, in Tito's open society post-World War II, people were studying in different countries. So they had access to information in ways that some of the other Soviet countries, communist countries did not. And so I think that there were influences taking place around the rise of performance. Um, I mean, certainly the questions around women in performance were more, in, one could argue, more dangerous in former Yugoslavia at that time than they were in America, where we were having our um, women's liberation movement, you know, right. at that time. So, And there, there's, I'm, I'm segueing myself, uh, they're, they're dangerous now too. Um, I want to bring things a little bit to a more con uh, a current context, uh, going back to the themes that we were talking about, memory, memory repeating, denial, consequence of denial and history and manifestations of trauma. Um, there's one artist whom we both worked with, Melissa, who was exhibiting at our at C24 Gallery a couple of years ago, Jayashree Abhinchandani, who's um, raper, is that the term? Uh, the, the artist who was a mentor in that uh, seat of authority, raped her many years ago, traumatized her, obviously and has had since died, but then was being celebrated in retrospective uh, at the Met Brower. And um, she led a silent protest, uh, which was, you know, the trauma never left her. And it was kind of the only way that she was able to kind of deal because it was absurd to her that this person's then being celebrated, widely celebrated. And the horror of it is, or typically, you know, she was met with all kinds of opposition and, um, uh, violence towards her for being, for protesting about uh, the trauma she had undergone. And even recently, as in just a few days ago, Representative uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez um, accounted that she too was a victim of um, sexual assault 
and it didn't she didn't feel that she necessarily needed or felt well enough to bring it out in the public for so many reasons because everyone blames the victim but also now because after the uh the coup attempt on the capitol she felt the need to be able to bring this up as well so um it's it's every day obviously we know this it's it's kind of all the time but i i feel it's it's so important for people of influence to be able to say things and and aoc got um attacked for that as well it's Anyway, um, but so, uh, Melissa, you have another question I'd like you to bring before we all. Throw yeah, I mean, you know, and, and again, <laughs> uh, towards these, uh, you know, these more global ideas of traumas and, and the ways that people are putting their bodies into spaces where traumas can be explored. I mean, Americans have a terrible propensity for making their movements the most important. And so by bringing up Black Lives Matter, it's not meant to assert that this is not something that's completely global in its context. Um, rather to bring up what has toppled one of the most artistically rich conversations around monuments that, you know, it's in, in history right now. I mean, we are really entering a moment where we're completely radically rethinking um, what a monument is. And so, again, with Alana's work, you know, I, I think about this sort of radical new idea of a monument. I have the privilege of working with uh, Nisa Page Lieberman, who's a curator of public art and, um, and also monuments. Uh, she specializes um, in work with BIPOC women. And she has a great quote, you know, I reached out to her because I've been following her work and working with her for so long. But I, I think of this being um, perfect for Alana's work. And she states, new monuments need not be designed for permanence. Of course, you know, permanence being the way we've thought of, of um, public works of monument until now. Rather, they can be ephemeral gestures, performative, temporal, durational works. Um, they can be conceptualized and activated with and for the public quickly and responsively. And so, Alana, um, I'd love to ask you, you know, how do you think these works act as memorials and, and how do they amplify histories and how might they be transformative, uh, transformative as performances rather than permanent installations? Yeah, I mean, the, the, um, uh, the question of how, uh, how to memorialize something or how to, how to deal with memory and collective memory, it's, it's something I'm also, like, my work is an inquiry into it, you know? And um, so it's, um, I think that it can, um, of course, like the performance work, it can uh, touch people emotionally, psychologically in ways that, you know, that, um, that other methods don't, you know, each of them, each of them are, are different. Um, but I'm not really trying to like, I, I basically want to provoke this question with my work, exactly the question you just asked, rather than to provide an answer for the question, you know, so and then this is like, one experience that I offer to people and I hope to pr provoke thought that basically to provoke questioning and to provoke thought and perhaps this work can do it in a way that speaks more to one person than another method um, but I think also um, I wanted to work with these extended geographical spaces landscapes of trauma with the two final works uh, that we've looked at today um, exactly also because the topic of how to memorialize when it's, this is going over, you know, many kilometers um, is like, a, it becomes a much more complicated question to answer. And so this, this is one, um, this is one approach that using the body to reactivate in a way that's not permanent, but perhaps powerful. Yeah, and I, I'm also very intrigued with the way that uh, video has become some um, new new form of distribution of this event um, that I think extends all these conversations in a really interesting way. And one of the things I note with the two bodies of work, you know, the two videos is that the um, aiming for hopelessness is like very beautifully edited as something that becomes um, you know, I mean, I wouldn't call it a monument, but it, but it becomes something that's got a permanence to it. You know, it's not just a charrette record of the event. It's something that translates it and transforms it, which, you know, I think is really interesting in the context of Nisa's thoughts around um, new monuments and, and new gestures, right? 
So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. With the video works, actually, I was very much interested in not documenting the performance, but distorting the performance and creating a new mm -hmm. work, actually, with the videos. And so um, that's why these video pieces are so special and they have very limited edition because they really are another monument in, uh, in themselves. And for both of these performances, um, also, I did not announce in public that I would do them. And that was a decision I made because if I would have a following as I would do these, you know, go over these yeah. landscapes of trauma, it would completely, it would completely change the work and it needed to have- Come on, I need to jump in. Could you speak up a little bit, please? Or, or folks are having a difficult time hearing. I, I didn't announce, um, I didn't announce the, uh, the performances that I did in public space for running on empty and aiming for hopelessness because um, I knew that if I would have people following me along these journeys on these landscapes of trauma, that it would completely change the, it changed the action and it needed to have the solitary quality. So the work is actually really um, like, a, is, yeah. The work ultimately is really meant for the video in terms of reaching people. Let me ask you a question, Alana. Um, you're, you're saying that that uh, there were residents of the areas when you're doing the research that were that were interested in and and helped in some ways with the project. Have you gone back to to those areas, to those regions, and and shared your experiences or the or the project? Is there an interest in you doing that? Is there an interest in you having these projects? exist somewhere, uh, anywhere in those areas or projected or? I still work with, yeah, I mean, I, especially in Romania, actually I was like living even in Bucharest for a while and I started working with, um, with some curators also independently of this project and we still work together, you know, and I, I really have, um, I built a network there that I consider to be very much part of like my concept of home, in, <laughs> you know, in, in another country. Right, and right. There's follow up and there's a continued sort of exchange in relationship. Yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, we have about 10 minutes left in our time. Uh, we do have the floor is open to for any viewers to ask questions or pr propose questions, or we'll ask them. Melissa um, and I also, which is fine. Um, I, I think there was one or that was already answered. Yes, I guess so. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, somebody so, asked for the for the specific names of the artists I mentioned, Sanya Vekovic and Milica Tomic. So that is now available in answers to fabulous <laughs> people to research. Great, great. Um, I wanted to ask you, Alana, also, so, so, you know, this wraps up, I guess, seven years of, of this particular project. But I mean, I see all your work overlaying, dovetailing, obviously. Um, do you, could you share with us some of the things you're working on now or, or considering and, and what does is, what is the future look like during lockdown, after lockdown? Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like parallel to the work um, in the Balkans, I always had a, like other practice. <laughs> And um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, let's see. I am working on the developing body of work called Facts of Violence. And with right. this, uh, this was exhibited in Berlin at Gallery Quadrat in 2019. And then mm -hmm. it went to this museum in Sweden in Sundtal um, at the beginning of 2020. Um, and uh, really there I'm looking at uh, what I'm quite interested in is psychological violence, you know, not instances of psychological violence because this is the, the kind that is the most difficult to distinguish and to define. Mm -hmm. um, you know. And so, but you know, running on empty also fits into that body of work as well. So there's an, over, yeah, there's an overlap there. Um, and uh, yeah, I think generally the pieces are just very much um, yeah, wanting to question the, the, question the conventional. And mm -hmm. I do quite a lot of work with uh, pillows actually are like reappearing in many different ways in my pieces. With well, I, I was gonna ask your, your relationship with objects. You have yeah. uh, pillows in, in your performance and, and irons. And uh, what is the relationship with, with that? And I know you're, I have a thing for irons as well. <laughs> we, sh we share that. Um, these are steam irons. Uh, and, and your relationship to objects, because sometimes the object then becomes 
the end piece or end product of it. And how do you kind of sort of categorize your work separately, those that are based around and include objects versus the, the recent work, which is just purely your body as the object and, and the environment as the object? Um, no, I think all of it is completely connected, yeah. And I mean, my performances like really often result in objects and they result in uh, installations that are later exhibited. Um, so I like this very much also when it results from a performance and there's a body of work without the body of the artist. I love this actually, because there's a consciousness of absence when it's exhibited. Um, yeah, but also the video works that I don't consider documentation, but consider them to be new works themselves. Right, right, right. And it's, it's kind of all a multimedia. Is, is the is the end result thought of as as part of, I mean do you are you thinking of the whole thing as as an arc like with you know with the 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 remnant object or is it at the end you're like that's going to be there at the end and um, that's great too um, I'm not sure I understand I guess do you, are you thinking of a visual post aesthetic from the piece so for example the the pillow performance the performance with the pillows that you did on violence then you had them the the pillows then on the walls that was that that was your intention afterwards right so that was sort of part of the the work um, to I have it exhibit that all, way yeah it all develops organically like I I wouldn't make the decision what to do with the pillows um, before the performance you know okay it, it all developed organically and. Yeah, so pillows are kind of, I think, um, what I can analyze for the reason why I work with them in so many different forms is that they are symbols of home, they are symbols of comfort, they are symbols of safety. And mm -hmm. um, a lot of- And now symbols of hate with the My Pillow person. Um, <laughs> the, the My Pillow guy, whatever his name is, but yeah, we can talk about that later. <laughs> yeah, we actually have a question. We have a yes. question from Milica Lapchevich. Uh, as someone who witnesses witnessed parts of Ilana's work and presence uh, in the Balkans, I would like to point out an amazing amount of effort, patience, and persistence she showed during preparation and research, reflecting into memories without prejudices and presumptions. Therefore, her artworks remain open and inviting for dialogue. Her presence was precious for histories unrevealed yet. Question might be, what are your experiences with the audience? Um which audience what i didn't get it i think you know question i'm i'm going to speak on her behalf Milica, if you'd like to type and do an update to that but i <laughs> i think maybe live like you know what would be the experience with people seeing you do this work on the streets i mean that's certainly an interesting you know question you've got a film crew on the streets of belgrade and all this equipment you know what, what was the experience with people engaging in that way yeah, well, I think that often it is created like wonderfully absurd, um, very unusual interactions, you know, where it takes people out of like the normal and uh, then the communication becomes uh, interesting. You know, mm -hmm. I think that that happened when I was doing, doing something publicly announced. I mean, I tried to create that with my work to cause people to come out of the normal and to question. Um, and also when it was something that was more like a not publicly announced, but in public space, because I didn't want the following to alter the, the action. Um, I think also in that case, it sort of did the same thing with creating these like, um, yeah, unusual uh, interactions. That and were, probably like, destabilizing to some extent. I mean, it's yeah, not something you yeah, see every yeah. day in week in downtown Belgrade. Um, so we have another question from an anonymous attendee. Um, how do you experience the restrictions on movement and body in times of lockdown? And how does distance from other bodies in daily life influence your work? Yeah. Okay, so during lockdown, actually, I founded a project space in Berlin. So I've, I've actually been very active during lockdown. It's called the House for the End of the World. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, um, it is a kind of, yes, it's like dystopian artist sanctuary is what I call it. And it's a studio space for me and also uh, running a program there inviting artists to do private studio pieces, but also um, group exhibitions, performances. We had a solo show with Hans-Peter Kuhn and everything is done in cooperation with Martin Krat uh, Krader from Krathat. 
And so uh, this, sometimes I joke and say that this is like the lockdown house because it was uh, launched just uh, two days after the first um, uh, Corona lockdown in Berlin in March, 2020. And so from the beginning, we did everything via live stream. The room, uh, the flat has uh, five rooms and we had five artists. So one ar artist in each room. Or, yeah, well, it has four rooms in the hallway, but we were able to, to space this out so artists could work there actually with the distance between them. It's also located next to my uh, walking distance from my place. So I could actually really, um, yeah, be very Corona safe, you know, and just walk there and work and do live streams and work in solitary space. And it, so it was, and it had a certain urgency because of the current situation of the pandemic. So it's been for me a time that's been really extremely active creatively. And um, the I work in so many different ways apart from just only the live performance with the body and the audience that I haven't felt like anything was lacking in that regard. Fascinating. We so this is great. We have probably time for a couple more questions, right? We've got a couple more questions. Yes. Okay, yes. great. If we have them, fantastic. So, yeah. All right, great. From Sherry Katz, how do you keep your personal identity from being psychologically harmed from the traumatizing effects of your artistic work? I think that's a really um, empathetic question. Um. Well, I mean. One has to protect oneself, you know, there's times like uh, when I'm, yeah, I'm working with things that are extremely heavy and when I, I feel the weight of it very much in my body and in my mind, <laughs> my psyche, you know, um, I then I channeled that into my work and I made a, I made a piece um, in 2015 was the performance, it was a video performance and it's called Borders and Lines and I carve a barcode into my chest with a razor blade. Um, and the video then was edited and finished in 2019. Uh, so with that, I, I, I made the statement that, yeah, I was turning my body into a landscape of trauma that was reflecting all of the geographical and historical landscapes of trauma surrounding me. It was a, a direct reaction to everything that I was experiencing inside uh, with this project I was pursuing in the Balkans. Um, and so it was channeled into the work. And um, I, yeah, I felt like it was an extremely strong work. And yeah, that, that this is one way. <laughs> of um, so, uh, oh, it looks like we actually have even Radoš Pilicic. Oh my gosh, David, Radoš yes, Pilicic is in the house. Um, well, so let's. This is an yeah. old colleague of ours that has another. Yeah, office. yeah, yeah. Um, I work at an anti-torture organization, and we seek to get torture out of its dark corner, and for people to understand that violence against women is torture, violence against children is torture, police brutality is torture, migrant separation is torture. But it is difficult for perpetrators, but curiously also victims, to admit or conceive of what they were subject to as torture. So I'm curious, when doing some of your self-inflicting pain works or the endurance works, how, do, how much do you begin to feel a solidarity with victims of violence or torture, or indeed uh, with the torturer or perpetrators of violence, repression, or um, stress reduction? Induction. Big. Induction, excuse <laughs> me, thank you. Big question. Um, okay, yeah, I mean, um, in fact, the violence, actually, uh, I'm looking at something from Freud, which is the like, repetition compulsion, which is that when a person experiences uh, trauma, uh, yeah, a history of violence, torture, um, that th it can happen, that it's disassociated and that one remembers it through repeating it, but unconsciously. So repetition becomes a form of memory. And this is kind of the premise actually for the whole like body of work. And so, um, yeah, I, I question how much I'm doing that in my work, you know? Um, so maybe recreating situations of, um, of, of trauma uh, unconsciously in order to understand something about them, uh, to reconcile something with them 
and you know so yeah I mean you know this is also where interdisciplinary engagement is so I, I think so much about the work that artists are doing specifically with trauma survivors, whether, you know, they're, whether um, Syrian refugees or, or Bosnian, you know, um, rape survivors. I mean, this is a, a strategy of um, helping people recognize, and it's a, a, can be a very slow and complex process and one that works for some people and not others. But I also think about the ways that um, performances and, and works of art um, can embody things in just a different way than words or therapy or different, you know, disciplines can, can help people recognize. And so I think they can be very, in a good way, they can be triggering of something. And, um, you know, that I, I see that essence in your work as well. Um, if we have one more, space. and I want to ask one one thing uh, of you again, Alana, um, are there moments when you're doing a performance or when you're preparing for a performance where you are at a you're you're at your emotional capacity to be able to engage, you know, or or can you immediately separate yourself and say I have to continue this project, or there's just times where I don't have the emotional fortitude. It's all too heavy right now. Um, do you carry that along through your process? There's no separation. Like whatever is happening inside of me is part of my work. It's channeled mm -hmm. into my work. So I don't, I would never try to repress something or conceal something actually. And so, uh, so it is, so it could, it can, so because it's part of your work, then it can be overcoming. And then it's just, you're living it. And it's like, I'm not, go maybe not going to the studio that day because this is all part of it too. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think I, I do like push myself a lot because I don't mm -hmm. like to feel the limitations of my body. I will admit that. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, but I mean, yeah, like whatever, um, uh, whatever sort of crisis or whatever sort of emotional or psychological situation um, I'm in, I channel that into the work and I don't try to repress it or hide it and keep the work separate from it. It's just sort of got an it. approach, you know? Got it, got it, got yeah. It. And, um, yeah. <laughs> I've, so, uh, I, Dennis has reminded me that, um, the Goethe Institute will provide a Google form for further questions for Ilana. Um, and, uh, so if anybody has an additional question they'd like to type in now, um, that would be great. Um, and again, this, this is, has been recorded and will be available on the website too. Yeah. So, uh, with that again, um, thank you, Alana, so much. Um, it's very exciting for me to, to hear more deeply about your work and your experiences and how, um, it comes to existence and how we're able to share it because everything you're going through, um, you're so generously taking it on and, and transforming yourself and your psyche so that we can experience it as well. So it's, it's a bit of a gift to be able to kind of connect that way. Um, it's very intense. So thank you so much for spending this time. Thank you, go to Institute and Dennis and everyone that has been involved, Martin, for exhibiting the work. I can't wait to, to go see it tomorrow um, when it's freezing outside. <laughs> and uh, Melissa Potter, of course, always such a wonderful um, person to have working with. And, and your insight is always spellbinding. So thank, thank you, you so time. much. I mean, it's a, such a privilege to... Um, have spaces where we can show this work, particularly in this um, pandemic world, the idea that we can continue our artistic uh, voyages is just, it's, it's hopeful. It's really hopeful. So thank you, Alana and Martin. Thank you very much to both of you, of course, to go to Institute. And thank you guys also for the questions. These were really, really intense challenging questions. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Great. And, um, I think I'm still busy with them in my mind. And uh, yeah, it's like, uh, thank you really much for that engagement. And it's something really that I'm going to continue to, to think about. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you all again. Thank you. See you next time. Bye-bye.